What is up, down, and sideways, you absolutely stunning individuals? Welcome back to League of Unlock here, and Mark here with you, beauties, for another repeat of the show. And this is the post world breakdown we were delivered with one of the best finals we've had since, uh, well, probably DRX T1, which you know, it was about two years ago. Uh, but we get the Silver Scrapes, absolute legacy performance for multiple players. But of course, the talk of the town is, as always, the GOAT, Faker, picking up his second finals MVP. Of course, the first player to ever do that. And the turnaround clutch factor aura that surrounds this dude that came out in game four and five i didn't think he could make his legacy any more cemented but somehow he did I, I i genuinely don't think in the long and storied and incredible career of faker we've had a moment like we just had this past weekend the way that he was able to simply rise above what challenged him on the other side and will T1 to another championship. Yes, that's not gonna diminish any of the other members' uh, contributions to this result because that, uh, make no mistake, this was a team effort, but you gotta put that respect and gotta put that praise right onto the guy that gets it done, the one pulling the trigger, the one being the difference maker. And that of course is our GOAT Faker. And it's obviously, uh the engages you know you talk about the galio i mean the most important thing in these best of five moments and you heard multiple x pro streamers talking about it with faker is being in the highest possible pressure situation that's what the entire teaser video for these finals was was talking about the immense amounts of pressure that these players feel going into these world finals and then it's the split second decisions that you have to make oh a 4v5 bins tp'ing in front of us our only chance is of course we have to engage right now so i'm flashing in we're going in okay great i'm the silas i'm stealing the recon ulti i'm flashing in this is our way to take over the game Everybody follows up and gets it done. It was multiple games. You can go back even to game two on the Silas performance where he gets engaged on and survives at low health. This was maybe the best series we've seen from Faker since like 2017. It's incredible. You talk to these, you know, uh, uh, you know, high performance specialist psychologist type of things in sports. And they often talk about getting into a zone, right? There's a zone that you get into. It doesn't matter what sport it is, but it, everything just seems to come naturally to you. Things slow down. You're able to instantly react and do what you just naturally would do instinctively in these moments. All the things that you have trained, prepared, all these type of things, those are the actions that come through right away. And instantly, I'm thinking about Faker because for so many people, the, ex the example that you like to use, of course, is, well, just walk over this plank of wood. Well, you can do that no problem on the ground, right? You do it blindfolded, eyes closed, whatever, one-legged, all these sorts of things. I put that in the air. Now there's pressure. Now there's, you know, something is going to happen whether you succeed or don't succeed about walking this plank of wood. All of a sudden, oh, I can't do this. You start breathing. You start thinking all these type of things. That's not what you're getting with Faker. And that is so clear in these moments that, you know, clarity to make these decisive calls, have your actions, not fumble as you're doing them type of thing in those moments. That is incredible. And only the way that you can train and prepare for that is getting into these situations time and time again, exposure, experience. And of course, our GOAT, he's got that in spades compared to everybody else. He crosses the 500 kill threshold at Worlds, which is 100 plus kills ahead of the guy in second place, who I'm pretty sure is still deft. Obviously, first guy to get two finals MVPs, first with five titles. He's got more Worlds titles than the LPL as a region, combined with the LCS, combined with Europe, and even more than every other LCK team. That's one. He's got more world titles single-handedly. He's got more skins. Once he gets this one, then 62 champions in the game. Which which I'm just going to say it right now. I know there's a lot. It's, a, you know, for a player like Faker. And again, with a champion pool like Fakers, everybody's going to be jumping up and down saying, I want this as the skin. I want that as the skin. My personal one, please, 
a Galio skin. He is a nightmare to the LPL already, Faker's Galio. And you can't tell me a Galio skin with the T1 color scheme? That would go hard. Come on. Yeah, I mean, he's already got most of his iconic champions. You're kind of double dipping with the Galio. Obviously, it was iconic in this game five. But yeah, you bring up the 2017 one where he didn't get a world skin from that run. Obviously, they lost. But it would be poetic to have that. But the stats are absolutely insane for him. And you, again... Almost equally as impressive as the on Rift product when he gets announced for MVP. You hear the crowd chanting. Guma's sitting there trying to pump the crowd up. And then he gets asked what, of course, his motivation is. It's not the accolades anymore. And for him, it's just the fans. And he is actually saying just to spread positivity around the globe. Like, this guy is literally a superhero. It, it's so awesome and it's one of those things where you can see why the t1 fan base kind of splits out the way it does unfortunately where you have of course the t1 trucker fans and we'll leave them in their own category but then you also have so many of the t1 fans talking about yes our guy faker he wants us to do good things to be good people let's clean up let's do community service all these sorts of things his influence at the top of league of legends cannot be understated how incredible and special it really is when you look across esports and traditional sports you're not gonna find the greatest player of all time the best player the guy who makes it happen also be actually a really good balanced level dude that doesn't really happen in a lot of these situations faker is the anomaly he's incredibly special it was so wonderful to see that you know mvp type of ceremony and how everything kind of calmed down and he instantly gets back into you know faker mode because for a split second we had a little bit extra we had a little bit of a uh, you know Un unbridled uh, excitement come out from him as they finish off the series get that when he's throwing off the headset i've never seen him do that in his career even he's dropping a nice suit he, he's never he's stone-faced every time but he was hyped for that obviously curia there with the, the clean calls to say that they can close it it's fine guys just close it out we'll be fine we'll do it uh but just absolutely incredible turnaround for again a team we can't stress this enough they were one game away from not even making the world championship. And you go back and watch that KT series. There were no signs of you saying this team is going to flip a switch and be back in the world finals. It, it's, it's one of these things where it really doesn't do the success justice if you don't go through the whole year and really relive just how up and down this was for a defending world champion and all the stories that came through. And Faker you know, specifically, by the way, we were saying he's a liability in lane in the LCK. Go back to MSI, right? Coming off of what was a fantastic split domestically for Faker. We get to MSI. Every team says, you know what? Target ban him. Get him on something a little bit more uncomfortable. And guess what? He looked mortal. He did not look like the greatest player of all time throughout that event. Didn't even look like a good player of all time type of thing at the event. We get this, you know, a summer split through the LCK, still not necessarily to the same heights as spring, but starts to turn around, starts to bring out the play that we know T1 for, but not even close. No one would have been predicting T1 to reach the world finals, to win in silver scrapes game five fashion, the way that they did sitting on Summoner's Rift, one game away from being eliminated for the year from KT Rolster. And obviously, uh, pivoting away from the AD carry mid lane meta is maybe the biggest check mark that T1 got for this whole tournament to be able to completely change that playstyle, not to deal with the Zig scenario or these Tristanas and Corky's spam in the mid lane. The other big side of it is, of course, and Baker deserves all the praise in the world, but the other four members of this now T1 dynasty, three straight finals winning back to back now, the second time Baker has done that, but the other four members all leveled up to an insane degree, and yes, Baker gets the MVP and the highlights, but so many heroic plays from the rest of the squad. Obviously, Kyria's interrupt on Knight's teleport. That doesn't go through. Faker's dying in the rest of the squad. You might straight up be losing game five if not for that play. 
it's one of those things where I don't want it, but I do want to find out what is the world? What is the timeline where that does channel through? Kyria doesn't get the heroic poppy ultimate to stop it at that play. Because I think there's a, there's a chance, right? There obviously is a ton of damage and that is where a lot of the money was at the time, of course, for BLG on Knight's Ari and what he could do. I still think the way that Galio was, where the team members were for T1, there's an angle that is a total loss, but you are right. It is clearly a crucial play that he is able to still survive. The Ari's there, there's no question. He's not surviving type of thing. And you're able to push through at that moment as T1. You can look at the play from Gumayusi all the way through this series. I think, uh, you know, I mean, he was kind of the only one other than Faker, I think, could put his name into that MVP type of category, the way that he was contributing, the way that he played throughout all the phases for T1. And again, another slight little shout out to your boy, the rat, Zeus, Zay Shy in the top lane, doing what he does, handling it all. And it all came down to the pick that we talked about, that we highlighted him throughout this entire tournament. The Gragas, how it had been able to be a difference maker for him within the top lane meta, but specifically into that Jax matchup and how he was able to withstand it and then be a menace in those team fights. Talked about it all the way leading into this one. BLG didn't listen. They faced it in game five. Yeah, and I mean, he excelled on that pick. He more than held his own against Bin throughout this series. And we even get the Bin Jack sighting in that game five. And I mean, there's so many huge moments uh, before the final fight that secures the game. Obviously, that flank where Bin's TPing ahead after they've won the fight, pulled the trigger to fight them. Uh, and, you know, Knight is just missing a charm on owner maybe think so many what ifs that could go completely differently but uh yeah jumping back to guma again in that game five we forget how slow paced the first 25 minutes and tentative that game five was and it was guma through the laning phase who had like a 1k gold lead and when he does get caught out and killed by a good engage by blg around that dragon pit surely you assume the fight's doomed because guma has all the money and all the damage Guma doesn't get caught out there, you know, plays out differently, is, doesn't have to flash out, is able to save it, all these sorts of things. Uh, that, you know, there's two paths that go down. Number one, well, BLG still maybe wins this series if, if that doesn't play out the way it does for T1 to get their advantage at the end of that one. And secondly, if he does survive and T1 does end up winning, I think Guma is stepping away with that MVP trophy uh, in this situation. The way that he was able to play early in this game five, the pivotal one combined with how solid and stable he was throughout the entirety of this series. I think that he was going to be that front runner for it, except of course, in that moment, we get another incredible faker career defining type moment. You, you add in some extra sprinklings of that up in the top lane to close out the series. That's how he gets his MVP. I, you know, seeing this, these five be in three straight world finals, obviously such an incredible accomplishment. People want them back together to come as a fourth, but a little selfishly, obviously I love seeing them all together. The chemistry is on point. These other four guys, I almost want to see them away from T1, away from the aura of Faker, because we've seen previous iterations, guys leave T1 and their careers fizzle out into nothing really or at least fade out very quickly these four guys are still so young and at their peak i feel like on any other team they could be legit perennial mvp candidates and the focal point of their teams it, it's it's a luxury problem to have that we're talking about this one but yes it's a tough situation because of course as T1 fan right here is front and center. I want them to be able to bring back this roster. I'd love to build a dynasty, a true one again, like you had with the original T1 and an SKT type of era days. This would be even more different. Keeping that core all together, running it back and building on this success. You have to believe it's possible. But then again, on that flip side, understanding how young so many of these players are in their career and where Faker's part of his career is, not that all of it needs to spread out, but it would be a shame almost to think about it all staying in one spot in this period of time and going, what if, you know, 
we didn't get to see the peak of so-and-so over here or over there, what he could do on his own, how he could grow, what he could do with someone to develop and all these sorts of things. Those type of paths don't necessarily happen if we are staying with T1 is one of the angles to look at it. We've talked many times about this, and I think it still stands that it would be almost foolish for T1 to attempt to try and bring back the entirety of this roster given what lengths, what finances it's going to take to do so. At this point, you're going to leave yourself vulnerable to possibly not having any, maybe only having one of these guys type of situation. Maybe a little bit different given that you've won the championship now and there's going to be a period to have a breather and then talk about it. Not going to be a long period, though, because there will be a lot of these teams calling, texting, messaging, whatever it's going to be to try and reach these players. Uh, I mean, we're here in... T1 finances up like 145% over the last couple of years. So who knows? Maybe they do have the money to get all of these guys on a squad. But uh, either way, again, would love to see these guys excel wherever they end up. And they're going to because they're all 22 years or younger and still at the start of their careers with already two world championship titles under their belt. The hard part of this side of the finals is, of course, talking about Billy Billy Gaming, who it's a tough one to talk about, to look at as a whole. Obviously a heartbreaking loss, but let's be honest. T1 were on the back foot for the majority of this series. Down 2-1, even in that game four at times. Looked a little shaky and maybe things weren't even going to make it to a game five. But now you look at the year as a whole. You give T1 all that you could in Game 5 of the Finals. You lost in the MSI Finals. You dominated two LPL splits. Like, in hindsight, this is still an incredible year for BLG. I think as much as people, myself included, want T1 to run it back, there should be more people wanting BLG to run it back, to get another chance with this group. Because tell me, throughout this event, outside of a T1 that is able to level up to the Goliath at Worlds that they have been able to do, to have career-defining moments for the guy whose career defines the game of League of Legends, that is what stood between you and that World Championship. That is all that it was. And, and it still came down to a single team fight or two. Absolutely. BLG, you got to run this one back. I know it sucks being the loser, getting the pats on the backs, all these type of things. But what you've accomplished this year and what you can grow from this uh, painful moment is going to be something where I think will birth a world champion. That's what it's got to be for BLG. Knight, he played really well throughout this entire series. Now the thing for him, stepping back is going to be the difference between me and Faker wasn't about just raw mechanical skills. I was right there. I was better than him, whatever. It's those clear, decisive, clutch plays. That is the part where he needs to go back. He needs to find how to just, you know, fine-tune, hone in that trigger finger to be right on it, to be the guy for his team. Is that evolution between being the great player and being the greatest player of all time. And that's one of the lessons that you can get from this world championship all the growth that players like elk has shown this year is something that you want to build off of if you are blg yes it's going to take a lot to pick yourself up off up the mat from this knockout from t1 but you better be doing this one and i'd say out of all the teams i've ever seen compete year in year out throughout these events i want a blg run back and you know uh, knight specifically obviously he's him and Bin both shouldering a lot of this night. Wanted to be that first LPL Chinese mid laner to take home a world title. And he was confident from the get-go in this series. He was aggressive in lane, going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, putting Faker behind early on in this series. And I know because the TP play, he doesn't even get to be in that last team fight of the world championship. But yes, for the iconic all-time performance Faker had... Knight was there toe-to-toe -to -toe with him throughout most of this set. So, yeah, I mean, BLG, I don't think there's any way you can improve this team roster-wise. I know maybe On had was the only guy on BLG that you maybe said had an off-series. Yeah, and, uh, and it's one of those ones that we talked about heading into it, his inconsistencies throughout the year and, and you know, kind of looking at the inconsistencies between his performances when you're talking about a, a level of opponent on the other side that was T1 and what could happen. 
I think individually, though, throughout this series, there's maybe a small handful of mistakes that I would point out as being some ugly ones. But a lot of the ones that came through are where he is punished. It's just part of being the support. You have to play your role like that. You have to take these type of chances. And if your team, if you, if it's not right for everybody else, well, you're paying that cost. You're the one that's going over. You're the one that's looking with a bad scoreline at the end of it. I, I think that this would be a conversation to be talking about, you know, synergy, whether Elk sees this as his partner that he wants to work with for this next year and continue to develop. That would be where I'd be looking for if you're BLG to make a decision on that. Last note on these world finals opening ceremony lincoln park what did we think you get the player entrances during the song o2 arena the atmosphere was absolutely there for it i liked it i thought you know again we've seen some spectacular ones and we've had some relatively forgettable ones ones that don't really change the needle uh, anything type of thing like that i thought this was a good one from Lincoln Park, I think one of the best things for me clearly is you could see it on, on, on Mike Shinoda's face and the way that he engaged with the crowd. They wanted to be there. They understood that this wasn't just, oh, you know what? Oh, we've got a legal, some legal legends gig, whatever yeah, the heck this dinner is. Dinner at five, yeah, we're out of there. Yeah, no, 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 it wasn't that. It was, yo, we got the legal legends gig. Let's rock this thing. And they did a good job. I think that was fantastic. I like, you know, the opening little thing that we had with Jinx, you know, getting ready for our game. The only criticism I have for that is, I, you know, after that played and then we're getting all through Lincoln Park and we're getting ready for it, I'm going, hey guys, you know, watching with my friends, this is fantastic. We've got our cane coming right oh we don't it's a week later what is this guys how did you miss it it was so perfect for the lead-in yeah i honestly did think it was coming out this weekend i was ready for like a world premiere of the first episode like happening after world finals or they were saying speed this up we gotta get to the arcane premiere but uh you know a lot of the times these opening ceremonies it's a mix of crazy visuals i feel like the korean and chinese venues usually have more insane uh, video boards going on, but uh, you know, the live aspect of Lincoln Park, they absolutely crushed it. And I know getting such a big act like Lincoln Park involved was big get uh, for them. So this is the end of an era in terms of this type of format. I know we're still going to have worlds next year, of course, but this new look 2025, the lead up's going to be different. The timing's going to be different. So no more perfect way to end this era of League of Legends than with yet another T1 and Faker World Championship. Perfect send-off, perfect bow on the event overall. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, beauties. Thanks for hanging out. You know we'll catch you on that flippity flip.